This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad yourself? Not so bad myself. Um, looking forward to, we've been talking a lot about our conference agendas for the summer, right? Identiverse is a big one. And then Authenticate, which I guess is the fall. But we're going to San Diego, so it's like it's spring, like year round there. It's like perfect weather. Actually, where I am right now is like perfect weather in Augusta. It's going to be Master's Week next week when we're recording this. And I'm stoked about that. But also stoked about that that conference. It's just a, a fantastic one every year. We're going to start having discount codes available soon. We'll start announcing that with our, our normal lineup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have a placeholder on the website right now. So if you go to idacpodcast.com, I added all our codes. Basically, right on the homepage, you scroll down. So you'll see codes for Identiverse, European Identity and Cloud Conference, Identity Week, and a coming soon Authenticate. And I do love the San Diego area. We'll be in Carlsbad. Um, don't have a lot of details right now other than, you know, we're planning to be there. I booked my flight today, so uh, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to use that ticket. But San Diego weather has got to be the best on the planet. I mean, just nothing that matches Best it. weather. And I don't know, we're not going to like tease what we're actually doing, but I will say like what we talked about doing today would be like crazy fun. <laughs> so I think that's one thing, you know, we try to be educational with the podcast, but we want to have some fun too. Yeah. A little edutainment, I think. Uh, yeah. If it, if we can pull off what we're trying to pull off, I think it'd be an amazingly fun and different thing than we normally would do. Um, I will give a hint that we've done this in the past very long time ago but we are looking to do it better now that we have you know 270 some episodes under our belt and have at least a vague inkling of what to do but that is the authenticate conference that's october before that we've got the identiverse conference that's coming up you and i are both going to be there that's may 28th through the 31st it's at the aria resort in las vegas we have a discount code like i said on our main page but if you're listening it's 25 percent off IDV24-IDAC25. I know it's really easy to remember, so that's why it's on. It rolls off the tongue. <laughs> it rolls right out of the tongue, right? It's going to be on the main page. It'll be easy there. Go to identiverse.com. Use that code. That's how you can show support for the show. I think Early Bird might still be there or not, but it does stack with whatever's available right now. Don't be that guy or gal who shows up and it's like, oh, I thought I registered. I didn't. And then you end up paying like a ridiculous amount of money. Or, you know, you're like on the outside looking in through the glass like, I wish I could be in there with all those cool identity people. Um, so looking forward the to it. The funny thing with conferences, though, I mean, especially like Identiverse, obviously use the discount code, save the money. But the biggest expenditure for a conference in Vegas is not going to be the conference fee. It's the flight. It's the hotel. It's all the, the meals. Now, I think if you're going as a practitioner and you control any kind of destiny within your company in terms of what I am technology... You don't need to be buying your dinners, right? <laughs> Somebody will take care of that for you. Yeah. Um, if you're a real I mean, live person, heck, come find Jim or I. We'll buy you dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Make that statement correct. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, let's see. A lot of people are hopping on a plane after that's over. They're going straight into Europe, into Berlin specifically for the European Identity and Cloud Conference. That's June 4th through the 7th. So the Cooper Cole folks have given us a discount for that as well for our loyal listeners around the world, EIC24, IDAC25, 25% off of that registration as well. Again, I'll have it on our homepage, in our show notes, and you should have plenty of places to find it. But another way you can support the show. And if you're heading out there, you know, probably want to register soon because <laughs> you want to make sure you take advantage of those codes. And then we've got Identity Week, Jim. Tell us about Identity Week. Well, Identity Week America has been one that you've attended in the past. I was quite jealous. It was actually... Much better, I think, from the description that you gave me than I realized it was going to be. Uh, but I think it you had a fantastic time there, right? And I mean, obviously, you said this year you're coming. Yeah. <laughs> so we're b- both going to be there. Identity Week America is in Washington, D.C., September 11th and 12th. But they also have two other conferences, Identity Week Europe. That's in Amsterdam, June 11th and 12th. And Identity Week Asia 
in Singapore, October 22nd and 23rd. And this one, we got a 30% discount code. We use for any of the above, and that code is IDAC30. Easy to That remember. one actually does roll know, off right? the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, if you forget it, it's going to be in the show notes, of course. And uh, yeah, hopefully for those folks who can make it in to the Identity Week America conference, make sure to stop by, shake our hands, fist bump, whatever you're comfortable with. And uh, we, I mean, one of the biggest thrills for me in doing this podcast is meeting people at the conferences and you know, hearing from them that they enjoy the show, things like that. So whether it's in person, let us know that you enjoy the show or you reach out via social media, either way, we really appreciate when we hear that. And of course, leaving five-star reviews and a full-on comment, that would even be even better. Not that I'm asking for that. Well, you should be asking for that. Like, subscribe, all the all the YouTuber stuff, right? We're trying to grow the YouTube channel, so... Um trying to put more content up there as well. But yeah, that's all stuff. That's good. Even if you're just, you know, a subtle nod from across the room, like, hey, I know who you are. Thanks. Thanks for what you're doing. <laughs> like that, even that'll work. I get a kick out of that. We'll take what we can Yeah, do. exactly. All right. So we've got the conference stuff out of the way. We're going to have a wide ranging conversation about just a ton of things from any perspective. We're very fortunate to be joined by John Podboy. He's a senior vice president in cybersecurity for a major bank. We won't mention who. Uh, I'm sure his opinions are his own, all that legal mumbo jumbo stuff. But welcome to the show, John. No, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, thanks for taking the time. Uh, I know that right now you're under a weather watch of some sort. There was like tornadoes, hurricanes, and we kind of said, well, okay, we do want to go forward or not. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. It'll be the most, if, if something happens, it'll be the most memorable episode we've ever done. <laughs> yeah, maybe the last will and testament of John Podboy. It'd be kind of uh, momentous. <laughs> well, uh, don't hold us accountable for that. Um, we want you to be safe, but sounds like things are blown over. We're good to have a conversation here. And I think the first time that we like to have people on, and you're probably familiar with this, is when we have someone on, tell us about your identity origin story. How did you get into this space? Is identity something that you chose or did it choose you? Oh, gosh, great question. Uh, you know, I think you talk to people, you know, at a cocktail party and people ask you, you know, what do you do? And well, how'd you get into that? You know, most people will assume you, know, you had a traditional background, right? You studied, you know, computer science or you did something and then you, you know, went into that field. But, you know, like most people in this space, they kind of found me. And, you know, to maybe the surprise to some people, you know, very diverse background, you know, much like identity, right? Uh, physical people have, you know, various backgrounds and educations. And, you know, interestingly enough, uh, I actually studied philosophy, right? And somehow ended up in the identity field that, you know, kind of seemed uh, destined to happen, right? The questions of who you are and what you should do. But, uh, you know, broad liberal arts background, but always been into cybersecurity and IT. And I have to chuckle, you know. Uh, young John Podboy back in, you know, the early 90s, figuring out how to hook up a dial-up modem and getting into trouble on the internet, uh, you know, sticking stuff into the CD drive, you know, exploring, you know, what is this thing or the floppy drive, I guess, back then. So, you know, uh, you know, fast forward, graduate college, uh, you know, during the recession, you know, really interesting time to get into a uh, field, but moved back to Northern Virginia where I grew up. And uh, got into the government world. Um, you know, got really fortunate to uh, take a job as a contractor for the Drug Enforcement Administration as a systems engineer. So we were the team that you know figured out how to build anything that you know the agency needed. And you know, really cool environment. And so we had to work on a little bit of everything IT and cybersecurity. And you know, one of those things was identity, and kind of bit me. And from there, you know haven't uh, really left since. So we were talking about before we hit record what we're going to call this show. And I think I just came up with the name, The Thinking Man's I Am with John Podboy. <laughs> so here's my question oh, as a philosopher. And this is a question I always ask. What is I Am? Oh, man, I, I feel like we need a drink for that conversation. <laughs> uh, you know, I tend not to over overthink it, right? You know, at the end of the day, as a security leader, you know, it's our job to highlight things we need to do to protect and enable the business, right? And you think of identity, you know, traditionally that's been focused on people. And, you know, that's obviously evolved over the years and continues to grow into, you know, non-human identity. You know, ultimately it's you know, the things that we need to enable with controls, you know, whether that's authentication, authorization, whether that be API controls, you know, in this digital economy, 
And, you know, that kind of has evolved over the years from the castle and mode analogy to, you know, just, you know, build out workstation or server controls or network controls to, you know, really where we're at now where identity is evolving and taking on a greater role in the cyber world to protect and enable organizations in that kind of that corporate security mindset, but then also taking on a completely different role for kind of end consumers, right? You know, what can we do to drive consumer trust and enable that? And so it's a pretty exciting field at the end. You know, one of the reasons I've stayed in it for so long, even though I've done a variety of other things, is the opportunity to influence and impact organizations is, is so unique. Yeah, John, something that you mentioned there triggered me to think about a DM that I received uh, from a person named Nathaniel. I'm not going to say his last name because I didn't get his permission to kind of read this on the air, but he did say, thank you. I started listening to your podcast. I'm looking to land a role as an IAM analyst. And your podcast mentions how rare it is for people to go straight into IAM. I'm looking to do that. So what I replied was, I say, don't let anyone stop you from pursuing your dream. Uh, in the podcast, we speak from our experience and usually talk about what we see the most, but there are no set in stone rules for getting into this in, this fun industry. Best of luck and thanks for listening. And I, I'd say that, you know, when we have folks like yourself who are in the same ballpark range of age as Jeff and I, in other words, you were around when Pearl Jam 10 came out and you listened to it and it was like new music. And you still probably and listen it still to rocks. it. Let's just be clear they, here. It still rocks. That's awesome. It still rock. Absolutely. But what I would say is like there was no IEM industry really at that point, or it was so it was so niche that no one was really starting their career in that and probably spent their whole career in there. So but now I think if you're coming out with a cybersecurity degree, it's a very viable option. Maybe not even a cybersecurity degree, but I think, you know, it's that diverse background is what you said, like you're kind of a liberal arts guy. My original degree was in political science. Yeah. So who would have known? But I, it's, it's funny, you know, and Jeff will probably say the same thing, which is that politics is such a part of being successful in this world of identity. You have to have a little bit of tech. You have to have a little bit of business. But man, if you can't understand politics and, you know, make friends or what do you say, Jeff, kiss babies and shake hands? Yeah, something like I mean, that. If you can't do those things, like <laughs> you don't want to do the opposite. Don't going shake to babies and kiss hands. <laughs> there you go. That's, <laughs> that would be a very bad idea. But you know, um, John, we, so we have this podcast called identity at the center and you know, you and I, we've only met a couple of months ago now. And I never asked you this question, but why do you like that name identity at the center? What does that mean to you? You know, I, I think it means a lot of things, right? And, um, you know, identity really evolving to such a forefront of digital enablement, whether that's security, whether it's driving revenue, you know, it can mean a variety of things. You know, maybe the simple answer, you know, we have to put people first, right? You know, people are complicated. We have diverse backgrounds, right? Physical conditions, right? You know, in society, we have, or hopefully have, you know, the ability to accommodate people and the diversity of people, right? We're not analog, you know, in the digital world, we tend to think of things as very uh, analog, but they're, you know, we probably not, shouldn't be, right? We have to have really, um, you know, adaptive security controls and experiences. And so you think about identity at the center, it's, you know, keeping people, you know, in mind being, you know, we're here to protect them, be here to enable them, and we're also here to enable things, workstation servers, right, data, but thinking differently. And, you know, if you kind of look at the different methodologies out there, I kind of equate it to uh, design thinking, if uh, people have heard of that. If you haven't, go Google it, right? But design thinking and, I, you know, the skills that make you successful in identity are really similar, right? You have to understand people, things, devices, uh, network connections, you know, how things are architected and how they fit together. So you know how to influence. And you, you talked about, you know, whether it be political or maybe to use a different word, you know, using influence, right? You know, no one necessarily wants to invest in identity because it's not, you know, the most easy thing to understand or say like, hey, this, this matters. And so one of the things that, you know, I think has been really important is, you know, to be successful in identity, yes, you have to have 
deep technical knowledge if you're hands on keyboard. You have to be technically aware in leadership roles. But I think even more importantly is you have to be willing to drive transformation. And that's beyond anything that is within your direct control, no matter what organization you work for, right? Because ultimately, we're here to orchestrate from the phone you have in your hand to the workstation, to the server, to the application, to architectural standards, to user behavior, to politics or things, right? That's a lot, right? And, you know, obviously other types of disciplines have a lot to influence, you know, but, you know, in this space, it's very broad and very deep. So kind of being committed to, you know, diving in, learning that technology, I think is really important, but, you know, building those soft skills to drive organizational behavior. I love that answer. I think you and I have a very similar mindset of treating identity as a product for whatever organization you happen to be serving, right? Whether it's enterprise identity or customer identity or somewhere in the middle, right? Whatever that looks like. So this idea of treating identity as a product, are you putting out a good product for your users? Yes or no, (laughs) right? Would you use it? Are other people looking to find ways around it? Because they feel like if you are able to take that design thinking and say, yeah, let's design this with humans in mind because humans are going to use it. I think you're going to be a lot more successful in, you know, not only the adoption, but just the efficacy of the different solutions you put in, whether it's technical solution, could be a policy procedure, whatever it may be. But I love that idea of designing identity around humans. So you're definitely showing off your, your philosophical side around this because I'm with you on it. I want to ask you about identity data because I think that's something that sometimes that gets lost in all this stuff. Hey, We just put in an IDP and we can do single sign-on and MFA and we put in IGA and we can do automated onboarding and offboarding and privilege access management or vaulting and session management. That's cool. What about the data that you're collecting? What does identity data mean to you? You know, that's a great question. Uh, I can't help but chuckle a little bit if I pose that question at, you know, any of the players I've worked at, right? People would probably look at me like I'm crazy. Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Right. And you, you go talk to like a chief data office or folks that would work in it, they would understand that question immediately. But then they'd be like, why are you even asking? Right. Because we tend to think about data and, you know, a lot of organizations have data offices that have tools, techniques for moving data and transactions and the security, privacy implications. But no one thinks about that in terms of the identity context. And, you know, ultimately, I think I go back to that design thinking mentality of like, well, you know, in a good architecture, or at least in my opinion, right, identity shouldn't be at the top of the pyramid, right? DHR or something authoritative for you know the physical person or lifecycle controls for applications really should feed into those identity systems. And, you know, you have attributes and things about people or devices, but ultimately then it's going to understand zooming out in that architectural view, who's consuming it? Applications are. And, you know, I think the piece that people don't necessarily understand is a lot of applications don't just hook into identity and reference it. They hook into identity and then copy it locally because they need to store it for whatever way that application is architected. So when you ask me about what do I think about identity data, my mind can't help go into the importance of understanding that architectural diagram you I verbally talked about and the importance of managing that data because you change a setting in AD around hey, I'm going to make this field mandatory capitalized when it was free tax before. You may break every app in in your organization. So, you know, it's it's thinking differently about it. And I think maybe more interesting is, well, what does the future of identity look like when you start talking about privacy regulations? You know, this question of what data do you have about people? What are they doing is going to get really interesting. And obviously in Europe, Right. There's been a lot around controlling or limiting, you know, tracking of employees or customers, you know, in the U.S., right? We're kind of really at the early stages of those privacy conversations. So you think for practitioners, right, it's understanding what is your current state and, you know, potentially what could evolve over time. I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, Jim, I know that you are interested in this as well for this concept of identity data. Like, what do you what does it mean to you? I don't think there's one answer to this question, I, but I do think. John kind of pointed to the right point. So I think of identity in the realm of attributes about a person. The attributes aren't like flat, just lists of text. They could be things like relationships, potentially. It really depends on the organization. I think when you're talking about like managing identity within an enterprise, it's usually the data that you can get from 
the HR system. It's maybe some data points that are coming from other systems. But when you look at like a CIM environment, now think about this. Think about, okay, Jeff Stedman is the identity that we're interested in. His relationships are, this is his spouse. These are his brothers, things like that. Is that identity data? Is data about them identity data for you? What about what websites you've gone to within that realm? What about what orders you've placed? Where do you draw the line? And then you start saying, well, no, maybe orders that's not identity data, but certainly the person's name is. Well, now what if you have seven different websites and you allow people to define their name? Or a better example would be addresses. So in one system, you have an address that's like, here's my shipping address, and here on another system, here's my shipping address, and et cetera, et cetera. So now, as an organization, you will say, no, we're not going to now let you set your shipping address in those seven websites. You have to come back to some central profile system to set your delivery address. They, it really depends on what the organization is trying to achieve. So I'm not even going to try and solve that answer. But what I'm saying is, like, it, there are very few attributes about a person where it's clearly, yes, this is identity data that should be managed in the center and should not be managed in applications. It really depends on what makes sense for your organization. Yeah, you know, if I were to jump in there, you know, I think you tease on something I'm really passionate about is, yeah, you think about what is identity, right? Obviously, the centralized tools, directories, or SSO clearly sit with the teams that run them. But I think there's that broader definition and responsibility of, you know, how is your corporate phone managed or the consumer's phone or their laptop? Well, there is all that local data that sits in there about who you are, your behavior, that usually an identity team may not run. But if you think about identity as a primitive new perimeter, you know, identity at the center, identity centric security, we have to orchestrate that and no one else is going to do it unless we do it. Right. So like that mesh concept, of, I think previous speakers have talked about, you know, that graph, you know, what, it, who you are in these different systems, your behavior to really build out those analytics, I think is really the forefront of where security is going to go, not only for, you know, corporations to drive security maturity, but you think about if you draw a comparison, right, some of the largest companies in the world don't really sell a lot of products. We give them our data and, you know, they're multi-billion dollars because they're really good about understanding that broader context of who you are, what you're doing, where you're doing it to build analytics. You know, but we don't tend to think about identity and security in the same way, right? We, I think we have to shift our mindset of, you know, not that I'm going to advocate for browser cookies and the enterprise for tracking, but you know, this problem has been solved at scale globally in different markets like marketing. You know, how do we think about that differently in, you know, the enterprise or consumer space to really drive that mesh architecture? Well, I think you open up a little bit of a Pandora's box here because now we're talking about data and is it identity data or just data? And then who owns it? Who's responsible for it? Where do we see responsibilities lie for the data collection? And if it's identity data, does it belong to the identity team? And then how do you make that available to others who might use it? Should you make it available to others? If you're somehow collecting non-identity data because a marketing team says, hey, we'd like you to collect email addresses for people. You don't maybe need it for your system. Maybe email address is a bad example because everybody logs in with an email address. But go with me after this one, right? You may be collecting bits of data on behalf of another group. So who owns that data? Who's responsible for that data? Have you come across this in your experience? Like that ownership struggle or... Maybe it's not a struggle. Maybe it's clearly defined up front. Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, my experience, it's not even really a conversation, right? People, I think, think about the problem so differently. It doesn't even cross their minds. And I think part of what will drive the change in the conversation and understanding the problem of that identity data is, you know, more regulatory pressure around security or privacy. And, you know, who's really supposed to drive that? You know, regardless of ownership, you know, like most things in identity, you know, you kind of sit in between multiple lines of ownership, direct and indirect. And right, if you have uh, X amount of employees, right, you've got X amount of people telling you, you know, what they think and feel. You know, that's an important thing to remember in terms of how do we engage with people. We have to be hyper collaborative and focus on the problem that the business needs to solve. So, you know, always keeping it at a step above versus, you know, I think that direct ownership is important. 
What about indicators of compromise? Do you see that as an area where we can use these bits of identity that we're collecting to say, hey, we're noticing things? How successful do you generally see identity data contributing to an indicator of compromise? I mean, I think we're all familiar with something like, oh, there's a bad login attempt or too many bad passwords entered, right? Spray, passwords, spray text, things like that. But do you have ideas of how maybe we can leverage identity data to help with that? Oh, gosh, yeah. I think that's going to be really interesting. And you think about you know the analysis people put out there about the identity market as a business, right? People say it's 60 billion a year, 80 billion. You know, people throw out these big numbers. You know, at the end of the day, all that tells me is there's big problems for companies that have to solve. And, you know, there's foundational stuff you either should have been doing or you need to do, you know, SSO and MFA, easy examples. But then there's more advanced, like how do you start connecting things together? And, you know, people use that analogy of security controls are shifting left. And I'm not big on buzzwords. I don't, I don't particularly like them. You know, I think most people don't really know what they're saying or other people don't hear what they intend to say. But I think the, the point, you know, when people say that is architectures, corporations are changing, right? You're going to more SaaS solutions, cloud solutions, environments, environments are getting more complicated at the end of the day, right? We have to move security controls to, you know, earlier or, you know, to use the analogy shift left. And the way I think we have to do that is connecting all those things together. You know, to use a simple example, right? You, you may have Intune you know, in your environment, right? That has its own identity that may be separate from how you log in, say with a, a ping or an Okta or CyberArk, whatever the vendor may be. I think, you know, how do you connect those things together that may not natively connect? That is, I think, where the innovation will be. And you see a lot of companies filling that gap of how do you connect those in entirely new product categories. And so, you know, I guess maybe I'd conclude it, right? I think a lot of the legacy you know, things around identity, they're not going away, but they're really becoming commodity services and companies that are focusing on <clears throat> indicators of compromise and the ability to see, you know, where you have permissions, where can attackers get into the environment? That is where I think there are a lot of the value is going to be going forward of simplifying this complexity of the IT environment. Hey, John, I totally agree with you on what you're saying with like using buzz terms like shift left. In fact, when people use those kind of terms, I have zero trust for them. So I just wanted to get that out there. Um, so John, obviously you're gonna speak from your experience, right? You're not answering this for the world in general, but your perspective, when you talk about identity to the business or when you hear what the business thinks of identity, do they have any concept of what it really is or is this just about changing passwords? <laughs> <laughs> you know, still like people living yeah. in that stone age. You know, it, I think a lot of people struggle. Um, and I think that has to change over the time, right? But rewind 10 years ago, people were having the same conversation about anything in cybersecurity. You're like, why are we talking about this? Right. And I think it's one helping people understand what are we trying to solve? What do we need to solve to protect an organization, to meet regulatory or privacy requirements? And I think one of the things that is a challenge, identity is like a superset in cyber, maybe one of the largest, right? And we have tend to use our own language. Well, you know, it's been my experience, you know, that doesn't always help us, right? Because, you know, even within cyber IT, people are like, we have no idea what you're talking about, right? Because we're using our own language. They don't hear what they want to hear or need to hear. So kind of going back to that communication. And, you know, I think it's really important to ground yourself. You know, if you work in an enterprise environment, most likely you're not working for an identity company where you're, that's how you make your money, right? It's, it's other things. And that, I'm not belittling the criticality of identity at all. I actually think the opposite, you know, we can and should drive revenue, but it's not the direct thing that drives revenue and understanding that and aligning to organizational priorities is important and balancing that with risk, right? You know, just because we want to do something to drive revenue doesn't mean we should also do something because it's, you know, risk driven, but boiling it down to more simple terms and language. You know, I think it's really important. And, you know, I think things have evolved and will continue to evolve, right? Where people are in tune with, you know, vulnerability management or patching or the importance of, you know, security awareness, right? People understand why we have to invest in those things. You know, I think just continuing to focus on the business or the customer, if you're in customer identity, 
you know, what we need to do to enable them is, is a good way for us to drive the industry forward. Yeah. And I think in, in the banking industry, you certainly um, have been driven a lot by regulation and the need to drive security and on the customer side, prevent fraud for sure. Um, so there's like all this security benefit is obvious, but I'm wondering, you know, do, do you feel like the business understands or thinks of identity as an enabler? Like we can use identity to improve our, our grow our business. Yeah, that's a good question. I think it depends on how you position it, right? It could be that, uh, that carrot or it could be a stick, right? Uh, you know, sometimes obviously think we have to do things because it's things you have to do for security or regulatory requirements. But going about it in terms of like beating the business over the head, well, people usually remember that hurts, right? And, you know, it may be required sometimes, but it has a lasting negative impact. And, you know, I'll, I'll be a little bit more real, right? I think, you know, say in the customer identity space, yeah, it, it can be something that's critical, but we have to position it the right way, right? And let's maybe use an example, right? And I'm making up example. Like if I went to a website and it was painful for me to log in, to sign up, just to get in, I, I might not, you know, continue. Well, that's the easy one, right? Well, what about if I, you know, say go to, um, you know, a car dealership's website and they've got some type of buying program. Well, they need to sign you up for identity. They need to do, you know, KYC and KYC really is identity proofing. It, you know, for the most case, uh, they have to do background checks, identity proofing. Well, what if they said, I need to mail in a paper form, right? Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> right. You know, these are simple and easy kind of uh, dramatic examples, but they're very real, right? A lot of our, you know, digital products, softwares were built in the nineties and 2000 and took static human processes and put them into the digital world. I think what you're seeing now is identity continuing to accelerate where, yeah, we really can know who the person is really quickly with a high degree of accuracy that is tied back to financial things, right? And if we start talking about it in that way, right? One, you could talk about customer retention or onboarding or, you know, sales cycle. That has direct revenue ties. And, you know, that that is an opportunity for us to really drive and think about identity to drive the security aspect, but also the revenue side as well. I'll give you a real world example that just happened to me this past weekend. I had dinner reservations set up, actually it's lunch reservations taking my aunt out for her birthday and it's like, okay, great. I get a call saying, Hey, we uh, cannot process credit cards. We're only accepting cash and personal checks to pay your bill. And nope, <laughs> not happening. I went and found someplace else. They made, they made it too much friction for me to go to their place of establishment and spend a lot of money, you know, on, on a nice lunch and dinner. So I am absolutely in that use case of like, you're going to send, you're going to have me do what? Like that friction is such an important point that I think people really need to think about. You know, I, I have not written a check for a, a meal in probably 25 years <laughs> or ever. Like that's, that was yeah. the response. I'm like, really? Okay. We'll try your place some other time. We'll go someplace else. So I, I just want to echo that part. Yeah. One of the, yeah. One of the things I think is interesting, um, is you talk about, you know, this notion of like a pre-customer, if you're, you know, digital business, right? You can log someone in maybe, but they're not signed up for a product or service that you offer. Well, is, is it the identity team's job to drive that? Or maybe is it marketing? I think that's an interesting question because, you know, if maybe my spouse is a customer of that site and, you know, maybe I'm considering signing up for something. And obviously being I'm abstract here, but my point being is like we talked about, you know, in human life, we all have connections that, hey, I learned about this awesome podcast. Can I can I come speak? And you guys are like, yeah, this is great, right? Our our connections kind of brought us together, right? How do we do that in the digital world where we're correlating this data and, you know, that broader notion of identity and who we're connected to? That's, you know, very, a lot of, very clear and a lot of revenue potential to think about digital modernization in, in a real way. So, you know, I think we're not necessarily talking a lot about that as identity practitioners or security because we're focused, I think, more on the security side um, in a lot of cases. But I think we should talk more about, you know, what does it mean to drive connectedness digitally? And, you know, what does that do for the business? Yeah, that's a great point. Jeff, I loved your story. It reminded me of the Seinfeld episode. You know how to take the reservation. You just don't know how to hold the reservation. <laughs> 
And that's really the important part of the reservation, the holding of the reservation. Anytime we can get a Seinfeld so, you know, reference into a show, I consider it a win. We should probably just stop right now, but let's keep going. We should probably stop right now. That's oh, awesome. go on a high note, Jim. There you go. There's another one for you. <laughs> you throw a Kramer reference in and you know, I'll give you guys a high five. <laughs> we'll see if we can work one in by the time the show's over. Perfect. So, John, I mean, one of the things that you're tasked with, right, you have to sell identity investments to the business, whether it's for security purposes or for enabling some business growth opportunity. So what is the angle that you take? Is it you try to speak the language of the business? What are some of the tips that you'd throw out there for the listener? Yeah, I go back to um, understanding what's going on in the business. You know, it, are you an IT team? Because a lot of identity teams sit within IT, not security. You know, what's going on? You know, what are your leaders talking about? And what are their leaders talking about? And I'm a little weird. I, I like to read SEC and business statements because I think, you know, it, it offers an interesting perspective on companies, right? So if you're a publicly listed company, read that stuff. And I don't know if maybe you're probably more educated than I will be, but I don't understand a lot of it. But you do pick up on, you know, where things are going, you know, what's, what is driving revenue, where things are focused, what are they concerned about? And, you know, maybe that may not help you directly, but understanding that broader organization, I think is important, right? So what are the organizational efforts? How does this tie in? And, you know, if you're lucky enough, right, identity is a organizational priority. Um, that may or may not always be the case for everyone, but, you know, tying back into why it's critical for what we do, you know, what are we driving, you know, if you're in Europe, obviously there are a lot of laws and regulations where identity is very clearly tied and, you know, you don't have a choice. You know, in the United States, it's maybe a little bit more abstract, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, whether it's protecting money or protecting data or protecting just customers, right, it's understanding, like, how does it boil down? Because, you know, at the end of the day, right, for the layperson, you know, I don't care about us. So, like, why, why does it matter? Right. But it's it's about what does it get us and why does that matter for people and for, you know, people consuming the services. So you've been in this space for a while and I'm curious what you think has been what's the most important change that you've seen in the identity industry in your career in it? Oh, uh, I think there's probably two. Um, and I think one was the broader recognition of the criticality of security uh, and identity, right? You see a lot of flip-flop of identity teams being within, you know, uh, maybe a non-security to people using, you know, buzzwords of identity security or, you know, shift, uh, shifting identity as a new perimeter. You know, it's been my experience. If you actually ask people, well, can you tell me what that actually means? People are like, uh, what? <laughs> right. But I think what's happening now is, you know, whether it's the the big identity providers or the traditional security providers starting to offer identity technologies, is people really understanding, you know, the role of all these tools connected together and what can they do to protect people? So I think we're on the cusp of the next evolution of this becoming real, right? Whether that be passwordless technologies being real to uh, identity actually providing new insights around behaviors and indicators of compromise or attack, you know, continuing to drive that I think is really critical. I think customer identity is similarly on a different journey, right? Cause it has different focus. Yes. Security, but also a lot of user enablement revenue generation. And, you know, I think that journey is just beginning where, you know, has a lot of potential to go in many different directions around doing that correlation we've been talking about. So I'm particularly excited by that because, you know, it'd be really fun to see identity actually having ability to drive revenue and insights in a totally different way. You know, kind of going back to that analogy of, you know, cookies and Google and all these companies making money off of tracking behavior, right? You know, and thinking about it in a different manner. Do you think um, we've, I feel like we have, and I'm just wondering, curious your thoughts. Do you feel like we've moved past the phase of, you know, you contribute nothing to society, is, whereas identity is not really well understood, and now it is? I don't know if we've moved past it. Um, I think we're still early in that journey. And, you know, ultimately, 
understanding the role we play, right? Like I mentioned, I don't think any of us or most of us are going to work for organizations where we are the ones driving revenue. And I think it's really important for security practitioners, anyone in technology to understand how do, how do we drive revenue and why it's critical? And I, I'm not minimizing the role of technology or security or identity at all, right? But it's understanding everyone has different focuses in an organization. They're all equally valid and the role we can play and, you know, why that matters, because that builds that influence, that credibility versus us kind of bringing that stick of thou shall do this really hard thing called identity. And it's probably going to take five years and you're not going to really see anything until five years, right? We have to think differently about it of showing incremental progress, value, and impact and continuing to move on in terms of where we need to be in the future. So Jeff, was that a Kramer reference? Darn tootin' it was. You yelled it out at Newman. Oh man, it went right over my head. It was uh, uh, for the win, for the yeah, win. Yeah, we got it, the trifecta, we're good. Awesome. We're good, we're good. Okay, John, John so. The Kramer sliding into the apartment kind of reference here. <laughs> the Cohibas, smoking a Cohiba. Um, so John, um, as far as kind of what do you see as kind of the big future innovations for IAM and specific to the banking industry? I was going to throw one out there and then feel free to come up with your own, but FIDO2, pass keys, password lists. I mean, I think it's kind of just taking, you know, um, commerce by storm in terms of, you know, that's, that's the future is not just MFA because that's just the builds a, builds friction in getting in. Right. Yeah. Even though like as far as what it does for security, it's like a huge step up. So I'm not dissing MFA, but I kind of feel like FIDO2 is and Paskies is really where things are heading. I'm wondering what you think of that for banking and is there something else on your mind? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And, you know, I'd echo, right? Yeah, you know, I haven't seen it in a long time. The way we talked about MFA has to move on. And it's good to see almost everyone's already recognized that now. And you can use different terms, right? I think we all kind of alluding to the same thing, you know, adaptive MFA, contextual MFA, you know, it's all about, do we really trust that's you, right? And how do we prove that in a, you know, a way that we know for certain it is. But, you know, I think if you talk about the banking industry more broadly, you know, <clears throat> I imagine a lot of people have different opinions about banks, right? Oh, I got to go into a bank or it's painful, you know, but they play an important role in a society. And, you know, I can't help but get excited if you kind of look at the news, what's happening in the, uh, the Europe right now with Europe passing uh, a digital identity, or it seems like I think they passed it. I don't know, Jeff, I think uh, you're maybe head nodded here. Yeah. But uh, the digital wallet, European digital wallet, right, that European countries have, you know, wanted to pass this. And you can't talk about digital wallets without identity, right? Because you have to be able to prove it's really you in a really secure way to get access to that. But, you know, I think financial services as a whole is shifting from really static capabilities that were probably built for when you went into a physical place. You know, a lot of those controls, whether they're fraud, risk, security, you know, were transported into a digital world, but never really designed for the digital world. So I think, you know, we're about to see a massive shift and, you know, I think evident alone is look at all the fintech companies that are out there that are getting started. You know, the opportunity to do innovation is massive. And, you know, that I think is really neat because it's going to change not only the technology, but more important, you know, the impact for society. And you kind of really get into this broader notion of identity, right? You, people talk about decentralized identity, I think for a long time. And I'm like, yeah, it makes sense, but show me something real. Like, <laughs> You know, is anyone really using this? And you're starting to see real examples now emerge where you know people that are immigrants that have no documentation, like how do you integrate them into societies, whether it's Europe, the United States, you know, how do you connect them to service loans, right? You know, a large portion of this country doesn't have access to internet, right? Like the majority of government services are offered through the internet. That's a pretty important problem for society to solve. And it's really all around identity and how do you connect people. So I'm I'm really bullish. I think there's a lot of amazing opportunity going forward for decades. And I think the problems that, you know, we have to solve today or the past, you know, will evolve, right? And we're gonna have these new problems around the data and citizen enablement and e-commerce. And I think that's really exciting. And I think uh, you know, Jim, right, you were going back to you gotta build broad skill sets and identity, right? It's not just technical and that's really pretty important. Yeah, you know, I'm just gonna throw this out there. We are coming close on time and I want to um, 
be respectful of your time, so more of a rapid fire. And I'm going to bring up something that I don't know a whole lot about, but I understand these things are kind of quote unquote game changers. So financial grade APIs and open banking, two areas where I'm not an expert, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, I, I don't know if I would say I'm an expert either. Um, you know, I have had conversations. I can understand the use cases, you know, but I think that will continue to evolve. And, you know, questions I would have as I look into that is what problems are we trying to solve more broadly? And, you know, personally, I definitely am interested in learning more. So I want to ask, get your thoughts on a couple of items here. Just real quickly, AI is everywhere, it seems like. I have to imagine that you're seeing it as well as part of some of the stuff that you work on. Where do you see AI really impacting identity for you? You know, right now, it's not, uh, I think, something that we're seeing direct impact yet. I think the potential is there. And, you know, I, I try to have a level head about these things. It absolutely will be a game changer for society, for companies, no doubt. Um, you know, but... If you zoom back, a lot of companies are doing things that we said were bleeding edge 15, 20 years ago, right? You go look at the magic quadrant or whatever, you know, maturity scale, right, of where people are going to invest their time and money. You know, everyone said when the iPhone came out, oh, we're going to, you know, you know, build mobile apps. And yeah, companies kind of did it, but not really, right? And companies are still investing in those things 10, 15 years later. So I think practically, I think it's going to take time, but maybe not as long. You know, where I think I think is really exciting is the ability to have a technology that can integrate into that data set of identity. Hey, does this person really need access or did they just say, right? Are they using it? Give me the ability to know that, right? Have in really intelligent versus static controls. You know, those are easy examples where it's going to have huge influence, you know, in this space going forward. And, and I can't help but going back to the, you know, we have to drive outcomes more broadly, right? If we have the ability to see this stuff and orchestrate, those are great tools for people to scale out versus continuing to try to ask for more headcount, right? Because that's probably not a winning strategy, right? So I'm, I'm really interested in see how it influences the product roadmaps of companies coming, coming soon here. I'm going to throw another one out for you. Um, this big trend in the industry is around converged identity. In other words, one software vendor does it all and can compare and contrast that with best of breed. And if you're like me, there's not a black and white answer, but I'd like you to, I'd like to understand your headspace when it comes to converged identity versus best of breed approach. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And, you know, I think if you're a smaller company or organization, if you don't have an IT staff, you know, going to something like a Microsoft or some other comparable vendor, right? Totally makes sense because you're, you're really there to enable other things. But as you grow in organizational size and complexity, I think that question probably shifts. And, you know, I think ultimately to enable business security outcomes, we have to be able to shift tools when they no longer serve our needs. So I get hesitant to say that we should go all in on, you know, a massive platform because the stickiness that that drives and the ability to move off of it, you know, doesn't necessarily enable those business outcomes. So I think it really depends and you have to be really careful. So we've had a great conversation and I want to start to wrap things up. We were talking before we hit record that you're interested in vineyards. And so I want to understand a little more about this interest. I don't know if it's a passion or a hobby or maybe it's everything. But if you were to create your own vineyard, what type of wine would you specialize in and why? Yeah, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I didn't say where I live. Um, I actually live in Virginia. Um, you know, when people think of wine, they obviously think of the West Coast, uh, but Virginia has phenomenal wine and you know, amazing scenery, uh, probably not really well known outside of Virginia or, you know, people that are really into wine. Um, you know, so I can't help but think about, you know, wine's awesome, right? It, it brings people together. You know, you know, we're obviously really interested in that as an identity professional, right? About bringing people together. But also, you know, I think it's really interesting because, Wine grows in a place and it absorbs the flavor, the characters of a place. And so, you know, I couldn't help but think about, you know, living in an awesome world, you know, beautiful mountains or rolling hills. We are crafting this thing that brings people together. So, you know, personally, I love Kapsov. Um, but, you know, if you were to come out to Virginia and I encourage you to do so, right, there's pretty much everything out here. Um, a lot of wine that you probably never heard of, like Viognier or Tanat or Petit Mensay. These great white wines, red wines, 
you know, to have a lot of character and, you know, bring you out to amazing places and, you know, make awesome connections. I recognize some of those words, but only because my wife is really into wine. So I definitely know <laughs> Viognier. Uh, Jim. If yeah, it's a whole different language. <laughs> it, it absolutely is. And it's fascinating. I, I think that there is a little bit of a biological factor in this as well, because my wife is the kind of person where she can taste it and she can taste all the tasting notes, right? She's very good at telling you, it's like, oh, here's what the terroir was and here's the notes of this and that. And for me, all I taste is alcohol and wine. And it's very hard for me to enjoy it and appreciate it like she does because I just, I don't pick up on any of that. Like I, I can't smell it, I can't taste it. And so I don't enjoy it to the level of others, but I don't begrudge people for that. You know, I have a, I have a, uh, infirmity and I just live with it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, I think the important thing, like anything in life, it's about enjoyment and, you know, having good connections and time with other people. But I can't tell the difference between Coke and Pepsi. That is for sure. So, you know, <laughs> I've got my priorities straight. Uh, Jim, if well, you were going to create your own vineyard, what, what, what type of wine would you be making? So my favorite kind of wine is Merlot. And the funny thing about Merlot is I feel like people, like wine people, think it's lowbrow. First off, as I was thinking of that, that's what I wanted to say. The thought came to my mind of what does lowbrow mean? First off, that's like outdated. And anybody who's talking in those terms, I'm not taking advice from. I think it has something to do with so, like if you're drinking out of like a off, brown paper bag or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're drinking Merlot out of a brown paper bag, I mean... You do you, Jim, however you want to consume not, it. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's not been my experience. That's like Boone's Farm or something like that. But um, actually, I, so I guess Merlot, but I wanted to throw this other idea out there. So I had this idea recently of, you know, maybe I'm going to throw this out there. This is the first time you've heard this idea, Jeff. But you know how last year we did an axe stirring event for Identity at the Center, kind of a meetup uh, of all the listeners at Gartner. And it was an awesome event. And a few people who were like really into the podcast showed up. We threw axes. We had a couple of sponsors come out and like pay for the whole thing. So it was completely free for everyone. What if we did a high-end wine tasting? And like for people who drink, you're more than welcome to swallow. <laughs> if you don't drink, you're more than welcome to spit it into some kind of like trash can. Mm -hmm. But my idea was we'd have, I think the right term is sommelier. Somali like somebody who like really knows the wine who would say, all right, now we're going to open this 1997 Cabernet Sauvignon. And this was a great year because it was, you know, a drought or something like that. And, you know, expect some hints of coffee and black cherries or something like that. And then everybody would get like, you know, a half an inch of this wine and they'd be able to taste it. And it would be wines that most people would not buy because like $200 a bottle or something like that. And we could do it with like 10 different wines. So it, what do you think? Is that a good idea? A bad idea? I don't know, but it's sommelier. So that's how you pronounce it. My wife actually used to do that. <laughs> you mean the sommelier? Yeah, a sommelier. The sommelier. sommelier. Okay. Um, I mean, I don't think it hurt. I thought you were going to have something a little more interactive, like uh, doing a crush, jumping into a vat full of grapes and just stomping on them and stuff like that. That's pretty popular, actually. People go and do that. We could do wine pong. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. Um, I don't. John, what do you think? Would you go to a, a wine tasting of some sort? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, but uh, Jim, you said uh, you live in Augusta. Like, why don't you have us all to the Masters here? I mean, come on. That's a that's a <laughs> I, way I, better option. I definitely would do that, but I would not buy people tickets. You know, to buy those tickets on StubHub, they're going for like $1,700 a day now. And then StubHub's going to throw another $500 in fees. So if you got a ticket, I've got like several guest rooms in my house. And John, I'd love to have you over. Love it. But Jim, you're a co-host of the world's most popular identity and access management podcast. What do you mean you don't get tickets to the masters? Well, it's, yeah, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> How can I explain it, man? Um, they have a lottery system. They have a lottery system. I enter the lottery system every year, but just like the regular lottery, I never win. So if you win the lottery, you can buy up to four tickets for the days that you won at like 90 bucks a ticket. And then when you get in, they sell sandwiches for like $1. So it's like they do a lot of things that 
our traditions for Augusta. The whole thing is about it's a tradition like no other. Um, but if you aren't lucky enough to win the lottery, it's just like any sporting event. You can go on to StubHub and buy a ticket at some exorbitant fee. So think of how many people win this lottery. They get four tickets at 90 bucks and then go and sell them on StubHub for, you know, anywhere from 1500 to $2,500. Sounds like a pretty good investment. It's not, it seems rock solid. Like, you know, well, here's the here's the strategy. Just go win the lottery <laughs> and turn that ninety dollars into, you know, ten times that. Yeah. It might as well enter the lottery every year whether you like golf or yeah. not. All right. Let's go ahead and leave it there with uh, the fact that you're not bringing anybody to the masters, Jim. I'm very disappointed in you. Um I'm bummed. Yeah, I know, no kidding, right? Yeah. I'm I'm taking a I'm taking a training course on how to become a better sommelier. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You can find us on the web, idacpodcast.com. We're on Twitter, X, whatever it's called by the time you listen to this. IDAC Podcast. Mastodon at IDAC Padcot. Yeah, IDAC Podcast at Infosec.exchange. And, of course, look for us on YouTube. Start to put more content up there and hope to do more in the future. And, of course, link, you know, catch us up on, on LinkedIn. Send us notes, comments, what you like about the show, what you don't like about the show. We read them all. And for those that have sent stuff in the past, we definitely appreciate it. Um, we'll have a link to everyone's uh, LinkedIn in our show notes so people can ask questions or, you know, give Jim a hard time about the pronunciation of Somalia. So with that, we'll go ahead and leave it for this week. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And we'll talk with you all in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com and find us on Twitter at IDAC Podcast. See you next time on Identity at the Center.